Welcome to the December 2017 Surgeon Masters Web Conference, Holiday Blues, How to Succeed in Hiding Depression. A few Surgeon Masters Web Conference reminders before we begin. This web conference is being recorded. Discussion is designed to be open and nothing is completely confidential. Please click raise hand if you have a question or you can type it into the chat box. With that, I will turn it over to our moderator for the evening. Jeff, please take it away. Uh, welcome everyone to our December 2017 Surgeon Masters web conference. Uh, I uh, hope some of you appreciate that there was sarcasm and sat satire in the concept of uh, how to succeed in hiding depression. Um, I use that title a little bit because of um, you know, personal experience and the sense that really that's kind of the the cultural norm of uh, uh, medicine and surgery that, you know, if people are down, you're supposed to either suck it up or hide it. And if it goes even to, you know, more than just having a bad day or feeling down, but it's actually more of a chronic issue, whether it's related to burnout or, um, you know, uh, possibly even in mental illness. Uh, but, but any of these things, it, there's so many things in our industry that lead to the concept of hiding it rather than managing it. So hopefully we'll, we'll have a much more productive session this evening, looking at ways to manage it in a positive, healthy way for both ourselves and, uh, uh, resultantly on our patients. Um, I'm going to, um, you know, I think this is a, you know, it's also a little apropos to the situation where we've had uh, recent uh, few colleagues and our, one of our special guests, Pamela Weibel, uh, who's uh, keeps a more uh, thorough and excellent uh, uh, tab of the number of physician suicides. So for her, this is uh, not anything new and it's not any new for most of us, but had a couple of recent uh, surgical colleagues that have uh, uh, had uh, apparent suicide is definitely an issue. So I want to um, go ahead and introduce my faculty. Um, I did indirectly with one. Um, before we sort of start all these things, what, first we have Anna Miller, who is going to be, uh, who's a, a orthopedic trauma surgeon in St. Louis. Uh, Missouri. She's uh, recently elected as chair of the orthopedic section of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and is a current leadership fellow of the American College of Surgeons. We also have on our panel uh, Dr. David Hanscom, an orthopedic spine surgeon who, through his personal experience with anxiety and depression, uh, has much to share on uh, the concept of neurophysiologic disorder uh, or NPD. Uh, written some great things in many areas, but also um, shared with me a, a blog that he wrote a year ago around this time, uh, emphasizing one of the big issues related to this issue, which is uh, a sense of loneliness. And, uh, and David also has uh, some to share with uh, effective strategies that kind of fight back on these issues. Um, and we'll share his uh, website with uh, uh, Ann Pamela's uh, later on in our slide presentation. Uh, we also, like I said, Pamela Weibel uh, is a family physician uh, and from a family of also multiple physicians. Is that right, Pamela? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. But no uh, surgeons. No surgeons. No? Well, <laughs> but, you know, and, and I, I really am happy that you joined us this evening because what we're learning is how much we can learn from outside of medicine as well as our colleagues that are not necessarily in our tight-knit clan or whatever you want to call it of being surgeons, but there's so much to learn from each other uh, across our specialties. And, and Dr. Weibel speaks widely uh, on concepts of healthcare delivery. She's a best selling author of Pet Goats and Pap Smears, as well as uh, Physician Suicide Letters uh, Answered. Uh, and again, we'll share her website 
Um, I think you might even have a few, but I know in one particular is that concept of healthcare delivery, which you have on ideal medical care. Um, and we have a, another very special guest with us uh, who is, uh, we're referring to as Joe Sur Surgeon uh, as a pseudonym. Uh, Joe uh, is, uh, is going to remain anonymous for us, um, but he's, he's here uh, despite the sense that he doesn't think he has anything to add, but I think the value and perspective of someone who's uh, managing some of these issues and his life and practice and is young in practice, um, that he would be an uh, excellent person to respond to some of the things that we're sharing with, as well as asking us questions. And quite honestly, I think he's going to have an opportunity to teach us a lot as well. Um, and so he's going to join us um, and uh, be able to address the concept of managing depression and having to be able to sort of integrate that into his career uh, as a surgeon and becoming what I know he will be, which will be a, uh, a fantastic and very successful surgeon. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, surgeon burnout. Um, that's kind of an, an overlying uh, subject, but um, to me, these are issues that I think are important in focusing on wellness, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum. And so um, I just think that we, this is just one side of it, um, and we'll get into a discussion on some of the other aspects of that. So... What I want to do is introduce our first official speaker, which is uh, Dr. Anna Miller, and let her share some perspective on some of the things that she's uh, presented on and shared in this uh, overall category. Anna, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks again for inviting me. Um, welcome, everybody. So this is a talk that we kind of had coordinated for the Orthopedic Trauma Association meeting a few months ago, and um, I had worked with Jeff on it, and I just want to give a kind of a quick summary of mental health and kind of the current status. So I don't know if I can, okay. All right, so this is actually um, a national uh, ad campaign about physician suicide, and it really brings home the fact that this is not a small issue. 400 U.S. physicians take their own lives every year. And one of the most important things, and probably out of my whole little summary slides here, is that uh, the take-home point I would just say is to talk about it. Oh, more, sorry. So, um, so just like I said, 300 to 400 physicians commit suicide every year. So that's about one every day. Physician suicide rates are much higher than the general population, over double the normal population average for females and one and a half times for males. And almost a quarter of all surgical trainees have suicidal thoughts at some point in their residency. So this is something to talk about with your colleagues, but also with trainees that you work with and even medical students. So just a little bit more about burnout. So burnout and suicide are obviously different things, but in case anybody on the call hasn't um, heard about burnout, the real definition was actually coined not until the 1970s, and specifically the guy who described it, Herbert Freudenberger, described it as severe stress in helping professions. So this is actually a really specific problem that we have in medicine because it is people who are trying to help other people and then hurting themselves in the process. So the symptoms are exhaustion, alienation, and reduced performance. And it's usually from workload and work inefficiency, but more importantly, kind of the lack of autonomy and meaning in work and potentially work home conflict. So I think the take home point with the drivers is that it's not just working hard, but it's not having really an ability to make your life better. So it's really important to, again, talk about these things because it's very easy to miss, especially with very high functioning people. And I think Jeff alluded to some of the recent physician suicides we've seen. 
it would be very easy to miss that these people are having a problem if somebody didn't reach out and actually talk to them. And that's because physicians are type A and everybody wants to work harder and more and prove how great they are, but maybe they're hiding their true problems. And it's important to pay attention to subtleties. So not just that your colleague all of a sudden is talking about wanting to commit suicide, but more subtle things like not doing as good on his surgical cases or not being as efficient or not really wanting to teach the residents as much and maybe just little changes in personality that you might notice. Next slide, please. So how do we prevent this? Well, there are a lot of ways that we can actually get our colleagues help or even help ourselves. One of the big ones that people are talking about a lot now is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is basically just training yourself to kind of think happier thoughts. And this is actually a study from JAMA Psychiatry that showed that doing a web-based intervention that was free actually was associated with reduced likelihood of suicidal ideation among medical interns. And at the bottom of this slide, I've just included the logos of a bunch of free programs that I found online. I actually downloaded the one on the right, Happify, just to see. And it's things like um, games that you can you know, use to help yourself be in a happier mood or little studies where they ask you questions to kind of give you a score on your mood so you can keep track of it. So there are a lot of options online that are free and available to anybody. Next slide. And then these are just a couple more and I believe all of these will be available after the webinar so anybody can look them up if you're interested. Next slide. So there was also a recent symposium on physician well-being by the ACJME, which everyone knows is our ruling body for our residents. And they actually discussed this concept of um, used in the NCAA for sports science, and it is talking about how you can help other people. So it's important to realize that helping can, contains five separate decisions. So the first one is actually noticing the event, so noticing that there's a problem and interpreting the event as a problem. So not just blowing it off, but saying this is a problem, and I'm gonna assume personal responsibility, and then knowing how to help and implementing the help. So what we see is that most people may notice the event, but either they don't interpret the event as a problem or they don't assume personal responsibility. So it's kind of like when you have a patient who you are concerned might be abused, it is your responsibility to report that patient to somebody who can help them. And it's the same thing with your colleagues. You have to assume personal responsibility and at least reach out to make sure that they know you're there and they will have somebody to talk to if they need to. Next slide. So why don't people help? Again, because helping others is not just about one decision. You have to have these sequential decisions and a failure at any one of those steps will result in no help. So there are multiple things that can prevent the right decision from occurring, including not taking that personal responsibility or not noticing that there's a problem. Next slide. So again, you might assume it wasn't a problem, think it's none of your business, thought someone else would do something, believe that others weren't bothered by the issue, didn't know when or how to intervene, and maybe felt your own safety would be at risk. So. Another example is when everybody takes CPR training, we're all taught when you first find a person down, you don't just look at the crowd and say, somebody called 911. You pick a specific person and make it their responsibility. You and the yellow shirt, please go call 911. So I think it's really, really important, again, to assume that personal responsibility and make sure somebody reaches out to your colleague if there is a problem. Next slide. So these are just some of the things that we had discussed um, about potentially things we could talk about later in the talk. And I know we have other panelists who are gonna give some, um, some of their own insights, but just thinking about how to have the conversations about whether your colleague is doing okay, maybe some techniques that we could talk about, and then warning signs that people may have seen with their own colleagues. Thank you. So Anna, on, on that note, um, can you share uh, any examples or strategies that you found particularly effective or even just kind of an anecdote as to how you've been able to engage people in conversations? 
Sure. Um, so I think, you know, the first thing obviously is that you want to approach people that you have a good relationship with already. So if you notice one of your colleagues is having some problems that you may not be very close with or you may not feel comfortable approaching, a good strategy could always be to tell somebody who is closer to them that you've noticed a problem and it's really likely that that person had already noticed it themselves and just didn't want to say anything. So even approaching the friend of the colleague to talk to them is a step in the right direction. For me personally, I've actually talked to a couple of people that I was worried about and I literally, we actually had a couple um, residents and my colleagues that I've talked to and with every person that I've talked to, I use my opening slide from this as a starter and I just say, you know, I noticed you've seemed a little down lately or I noticed you have been late to meetings more lately or whatever it is that the symptom seems to be and I just say, you know, I sometimes give these talks on physician depression and suicide, and did you know that more than 400 physicians commit suicide every year? And, you know, I'm hoping you're not really in that dark place yourself, but I just want you to know that we all are concerned about each other, and I'm here to talk if you ever need to talk about anything. And some people have really opened up, and some people, you know, kind of blow you off and say, oh, I'm fine, I've just had a bad week. But I think just making that foray and saying, you know it exists and you're here if they need you, you're not forcing them to sit down and have a conversation, but just making sure they know you've noticed and you care. That's awesome. Uh, you know, it's interesting because as you point out that you, you never know the reaction and it might even be a case by case situation. I mean, I've been talking about wellness and these conversations and reaching out uh for you know a little while now and uh this week i had a very um bad patient experience with uh, an unexpected patient death and and my colleagues were reaching out and you know i have to admit my my baseline personality is that that it's not that i'm guarding it's almost like like number one i would just say so awesome that people reach out right and mm -hmm. but but i'll say no thank you but i'll stay in touch because i whenever i get to that point where i think it's the right time where i want to have that conversation or i've had you know little conversations here and there but knowing that i have kind of a uh, uh a smorgasbord of people to pick to to talk about something is pretty cool um, but yeah, it is, sure. but it is my, you know, initially, you know, I don't know if it's sometimes the location or if it's the situation or timing, but there's a lot of reasons why somebody might decline that, uh, to engage at that very moment. And it, and it's not a bad thing. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's just making sure that they, like you said, they know you're there if they need you. Uh, any other questions from others in our uh, on our panel uh, for for Anna? Is Joe still with us? Yes, sir. Do you have any either comments or questions at this point in time? Um, not really. I apologize, but not not at this time. No need to apologize. It. We appreciate you being here and joining us. Uh, once we go on and, you know, there'll be plenty of opportunity to pick up conversations or questions uh, at other points too. So why don't we carry forward? Pamela, Pamela Weibel, uh, I, I introduced earlier. I would love, Pamela, if you would also give us a little self-introduction on, on uh, uh, as well. So I am an author of this book, Physician Suicide Letters. I did not ever plan to do anything related to suicide as part of my career. I, I just was going to be a family doc doing house calls in a small town and, you know, uh, living the, you know, the uh, the life of a primary care doc. But um, 
what happened is back in 2012, October 28th, around 3 p.m., I'm sitting in the third, um, well, the, the third physician that we lost to suicide. I'm at his memorial service in my town. And, and for whatever reason, I just started counting. Well, I heard people whispering why. And there, there was this level of secrecy about saying suicide out loud. And, and that sort of captivated me. Like, why, why doesn't everyone want to say what really happened? And then I just started counting how many physicians I knew that had died under suspicious circumstances that seemed to be suicide. And um, by the time I left that service, I had counted 10, uh, two of which were men that I dated in medical school who later died by suicide at age 39 and 44. Um, and, and so this just, I guess, took over my life about five years ago. I've been, I have an obsessive compulsive personality. So, and I'm a problem solver and a healer. And when I get on a topic, I sort of can't stop. So, um, unfortunately I'm bulldozing ahead on this topic. Um, it's not a, a, a popular topic among, you know, d people for dinner conversation or whatever, but, but I do think among physicians, we've got to start talking about this, like we talk about diabetes or hy hypertension or anything else. So, so I'm happy to be the voice of um, deceased doctors or, you know, depressed doctors and those who are in despair. I was actually suicidal myself, so I do feel like I have a, a personal story to tell about this as well. So, and I, and since, since this slide is up, I will say that uh, my physician suicide letters book, I, I read aloud and there is a three hour MP3 version of it. If anyone wants to download, it's almost like a three hour physician suicide hotline because like, um, like Anna mentioned, uh, not everyone wants to have like a direct conversation about their mental health. And so I, th I think that a lot of people want to listen to things privately and um, kind of consume information on their own. And this gives them the, you know, it's almost makes myself accessible without them having to be on the phone with me and actually dialing, you know, to talk to a live doctor about their suicidal thoughts. So. That's a very interesting point. Thank you. And, and I, I will add something else to that, that this really drove it home for me. So at the American Academy of Family Physicians, I spoke in um, 2014 in the fall on, it was a um, now a blog because I transcribed it. It's called Physician Suicide 101, Secrets, Lies, and Solutions. And I think that was just the first talk and first, you know, sort of transcribed blog that I ever did that was in depth on this topic. And at the live talk, which was at a conference that had 5,000 physicians in attendance, and I, I was competing with, you know, it was 18 concurrent tracks that doctors could attend um, at that point in time. But they did heavily promote my talk and had set the room for 900 people. And I will tell you that only 100 people came to my talk. It was very interesting. Uh, the people that were there were really into it, but none of them were sitting too close together. They were all sort of scattered about the room. And then what was fascinating to me is then when I published this in print version online uh, with my 38 slides, that blog became, it was picked up by Kevin MD and Medscape. It became the number one most common and most read blog in Medscape's 20 year history of like articles online. So it's just, this is, I want to drive home the point that people don't want to have necessarily live conversations about this, but they do want to consume um, helpful material and they'll do that privately when you're not looking. So I found that very interesting. Yeah, I've, I've seen that and I, I don't know about you, Anna, but with presentation of some of this information that whether it's this or um, other uh, self-care or surgeon wellness issues that, that there's a absorption of the information uh, engagement to varying degrees depending upon you know what what they're trying to gain i think uh pamela is really highlighting that that point and i think physicians are sort of used to consuming information in print form um and in isolation <laughs> you know so i guess that sometimes works better than having a real conversation so uh, next slide So I think many of you know about the case that just happened on December 9th with, uh, this is a surgeon named Christopher Chad um, Dawson, who uh, had just finished his surgical residency and had his first job uh, outside of Dallas um, 
that lasted only six weeks because of his mental health issues that were out of hand. And um, I don't think his colleagues really knew what to do about it. I don't think his wife, uh, who knew he was disturbed, knew what to do. I mean, he was sort of left in this no man's land of um, not really getting the help that he needed. And he had been deteriorating, I'm in touch with his wife now, for like five years. And she claims that she sort of emotionally lost him two and a half years ago. Yet it's interesting, he continued to function as a surgeon for two and a half years after sort of emotionally disconnecting with his family and his wife. And uh, and this and then he graduated, right? And and then if if you don't know how this sad story ended, he he shot his children and himself on Saturday morning, December 9th. And so now I wrote a story of, about this. I published portions of of an obituary that was written by his wife. And I think that if we don't sort of run away from the horror of the story, there's things that we can learn by just sort of evaluating how we deal with 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 colleagues, how we deal with troubled colleagues, when we decide to intervene, um, how we intervene, what options we have for intervention. And I think my bottom line is, um, you know, prevention is so much better. You know, if somebody had done something five years, two and a half years ago, whatever, it would just be so much, so much better. And I think a lot of this doesn't have to be almost like staged and PowerPoints and, you know, conversations like that, but just a culture change, the way we interact with each other, the way we express appreciation and love for each other. And, um, and, and just, I would say having more, the one thing I guess I want to drive home in our conversation today is I would love for us all to have more of a, a, like a family atmosphere with our colleagues um, so that we're really thinking of them as brothers and sisters in medicine and not just co-residents or, you know, the surgeon down the hall or the primary care doc in the next building. I mean, I want us to take this on, especially in this holiday season, you know, as these are our brothers and sisters and they need our care and for not receiving our care, they might um, withdraw and isolate further. And this is sort of a you know, most tragic end result here. Um, while we're on the side, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer because I know a lot of his family and I know some of the backstory. Well, I think I think you point. I mean, there's several things just in the discussion of what you raise, in the sense that um, you know, one, I love the message of of more of a family atmosphere and a culture change, and I think uh, I think everyone on the call is on board and like minded in that sense that this ability to talk about something to share it as this is what we know and ensure you're in a good situation where you know inf more information. I think there's a lot of times where we don't know information, but we speculate. And some of the interesting conversations or comments that I had in follow up to uh, Dr. Dean Lorich's situation was that a speculation as to why, and, and I kind of had, yeah, I'm totally fine with, okay, if we could learn from that, but I was kind of like, kind of doesn't really matter to me it's like it's tragic nonetheless and more i think was the message of how could we have had an atmosphere where that could have been um intervened sooner or like like you're pointing out prevention um and that the speculation as to what would lead somebody to this um I think it's almost ourselves trying to figure out, okay, that's not happening to me right now, so I'm okay. But to me, that almost scares me because if that's the thought, then that would mean that if that was happening to you, you wouldn't necessarily be okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. What, what What's your thought on that? Yeah, I, I think that um, it's just, it's really hard for us to, sometimes see ourselves, um, I guess, from an outside point of view. I, sometimes we get so locked into the way that we relate to each other and relate to the world and this sort of high powered reductionist, you know, efficiency oriented medical sort of over accomplishment type A personality thing. I, I think we just lose part of ourselves actually in our training, you know? And mm -hmm. so I think, 
to reconnect with our hearts and souls and reconnect with the hearts and souls of others and actually be a real full-fledged human being again would uh, give us all a whole lot more joy during the holiday season and for the rest of the year, you know, than just sort of screening more for catastrophes. I think we're sort of set up to look for worst case scenarios and intervene at the last moment in heroic ways, you know, but it would be so much better if we could, uh, just reconnect with ourselves and others. Um, right. I want, I'm going to give an example of something that I think would really help this conversation. But uh, I had a medical student that wrote me, and there's, this actually led to a blog. Um, it was called Medical Student. Uh, she was less stressed in Afghanistan than she was in medical school. Okay. And after interviewing her for a while, and what, what, what we came up with, was that at least, uh, I'm just gonna read from her own words, during the first few missions, I was scared for my life. After that, I became numb to the fear and just focused on making sure I was able to save my guys' lives if we were attacked. The stress was incredible, but I had their back and they had mine. In an unsafe country, in a future filled with uncertainty, I felt secure because we supported each other. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of profound because, wow, if we just felt, you know, in our hearts and souls that we were supported and weren't going to be backstabbed and could really rely on each other as, you know, brothers and sisters in medicine, I think that would be almost an immunization against some of these horrific outcomes that we... I think that's a very excellent point and and excellent perspective. And I think that's what we're... Uh, trying to do and being a former pessimist, uh, transitional realist, and now uh, beginning to be an optimist, I, I think we have the opportunity to do that. And I think I want to share just because some of you may not have read my article on, you know, on obviously this, you know, this, this man who, who was an intelligent, brilliant surgeon who was falling apart in front of our eyes. Um, there are five ways that we can prevent the next physician suicide that I outlined as a result of sort of studying his particular case. And one is increasing awareness of our physician suicide crisis. Like again, just talking about this, being alert to the mental health risks of medical training and practice, including high risk specialties, which are you know anesthesia, <laughs> um, maybe surgery, um, definitely being male, okay, for every one woman that I have on my list of 699 completed suicides, there are seven men who have died by suicide in medicine. So I know the profession is still skewed towards, you know, male physicians outnumber female in practice, but um, seven to one, you know, like that's still kind of skewed highly towards so I am concerned about us being able to reach out to men. And sometimes what's interesting to me, because I have these retreats and teleseminars and such and the suicide hotline, most of the people who call me are female, you know, and I think just women are more likely to reach out for help or cry or be vulnerable or they're more kind of relationally driven. Men um, tend to um, isolate more male physicians. It's always a mystery. Like, how can I reach male physicians? Because they don't often reach out to me in the numbers that female physicians reach out to me. So I'm just throwing that out there for any men who feel compelled to reach out to other male physicians. It's quite possible that men would rather reach out to each other and wouldn't want to reach out to a woman for help with mental health issues. So I'm just throwing that out as a conversation piece. <laughs> um, Another way we can increase physician suicide uh, awareness is we do have a movie coming out, the Do No Harm film, which I'm encouraging everyone to see the movie trailer, which is at donoharmfilm.com. And this can then be, this is gonna be screened at medical schools and hospitals and conferences around the country. And I do wanna let you know that the filmmaker, Robin Simon, who's a two-time Emmy winning filmmaker, is making a 30 minute vision of this uh, version of this like 86 minute film that can be used as a teaching tool in hospitals and residencies and medical schools in the future. So that's something that would be accessible to, for us to have kind of a more of a prevention focused conversation. Um, a second awesome. thing that I wanted to mention is um, I personally believe that we maybe should avoid a career in medicine if you have pre-existing 
you know, untreated and uncontrolled anxiety, depression, and, and have already attempted suicide in high school or college. I'm on the phone with pre-meds who are in this situation, and they're concerned about going into medical school, and some of them want to be neurosurgeons, you know, and I say, well, let's just talk about this because I'm concerned, you know, this might not be the right profession for you, right? And um, and three is allow access to non-punitive mental health care, which is the real problem that once physicians start having issues, they don't feel like they can really get confidential health care, which is something that I think we can change again culturally. And uh, in this particular man's situation, I mean, he was having marital issues, of course, for two and a half years, his wife, and he kind of lost their emotional connection. And um, it's been hard to have non-punitive marital counseling because a friend of mine who applied for a license in Oregon, they wanted to access her her marriage counseling records. And, and it delayed her license for like six months. And you're thinking like, whose business is this? You know what I mean? Everyone's right. destroying a divorce. You shouldn't have to turn over your marriage counseling records to the state medical board, you know? And then the fifth one is humanizing medical training, you know, like this chronic sleep deprivation and the other human rights violations that go on in our medical training that would be, you know, just impossible in any other industry. It's, 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 uh, it needs to be addressed. So, so those are some, and the one thing that I, the summary point that I think is really interesting here is, okay, so did Chris have pre-existing anxiety before medical school? He, yes, he did. If he were a realtor or an auto mechanic, would he have been able to access confidential non-punitive care for his anxiety? Yes. Would he have been more resourced to assist his children with anxiety, which by the way, that was sort of like a mercy killing in his mind because his son was having terrible anxiety problems and so was his daughter. And so he didn't want them to have to live the miserable life that he was living. So he took them out, you know, um, like, yeah, if he had been able to get help for his anxiety and his mental health issues, he would be in better shape to help his children. And would, he would have would he have had more time with his wife to invest in his marriage had he not been a surgeon? I bet he would. Um, would he have, he and his children still be alive now? I think the chances are much greater that they would be alive. So. I know this is sort of a depressing slide and, and we can move on, but I just think there's a lot to learn from, from this story. And Next. it sounds like there's a lot to learn from all the stories. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 You know, one, one good news thing is that one of the people touch base with me was, uh, was a, um, uh, program director and a former department uh, chairman who shared that after some recent events that they actually did sit down having a conversation with their orthopedic residents um, just as a discussion point and to me I I don't can't even imagine and I'm I can guarantee you that that didn't happen 10 20 years ago when I was aware of suicides that were happening around me so I think that's a, a great sign of progress Oh, definitely. We're definitely coming a long way. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. And thank you for inviting me to even be here. This next slide is um, an altar that I put up during a, a retreat that I had uh, just because so many times I've heard from family members, oh, I, I wish my uh, husband's son, whomever would have known that you had these retreats, he'd still be alive. You know, and it just makes me so sad that this was so preventable. So I sort of wanted them at the retreat and I put up several of their pictures. And two of these are three of these guys are surgeons. Uh, the top left black and white picture, that gentleman died the year I was born in 1967. His current uh, daughter, who was five years old at the time of his death, uh, reached out to me to thank me for talking about this because his death has been somewhat of a mystery for their entire family, their life. They just had no idea why he would die. He was a pediatric um, surgeon, cardiac surgeon. And so I think it, you know, he probably lost some cases and couldn't um, live with himself, uh, didn't have um, anyone to talk to about these traumatic cases. And, um, and just, it's almost like suicide was the ultimate form of self punishment. And he tried to keep himself alive by staring at his a picture of his seven children, he would stare at that over and over and over again. And, you know, his wife didn't know what to do. She caught him with the gun, took him to the hospital, you know, now he's being treated at the hospital where he's a pediatric surgeon, you know, that's not going to work out well, then we're going to, we're going to, 
get him signed up for ECT. I mean, the man just felt like he had nowhere to go for help. And so his only option he felt was suicide, you know, and, and this is still happening. The, the guy next to him holding the little heart, you can see, I mean, that's Jonathan Drummond Webb. I don't know if any of you know him, another pediatric cardiac surgeon who was really, really famous. He has a Wikipedia page. And um, I recently reached out to his wife. Um, he had died by suicide. And she said, in 13 years, you're the first person who's reached out to me to honor my husband. And, and this is really fascinating. One of the responses she said, um, she said, had he died by cancer, they would have erected a statue in the middle of town. But because it was suicide, he's been shunned for 13 years until you called me today. And she's a physician herself. So um, and the other surgeon there is in a dark blue scrubs. Um, uh, he's um, Greg Feldman, a vascular surgeon. So I don't know much about his backstory, but I guess I just want you to know, gosh, there's a lot of people that are dying here. Are some of them on a slide. Uh, this brings, this drives it home to me uh, that these are real people with real families that left behind kids. Um, sadly, Thomas Gahagan, who's the black and white uh, picture on the top left, after he died by suicide, as adults, two of his seven children also died by suicide in the same method. So like the increased risk of suicide to your family members is very high as well, which I think, again, goes back to the Chris Dawson case. He's taking his children out who already were not coping well with high anxiety because what kind of life was he going to leave them with after his suicide? You know, so this, it's just, it's very intense. Next slide, which I think is my final slide, which is solution oriented. Um, I think number one, which we've already pointed out earlier, the solution is to talk. Like the more we can talk about this, like any other topic uh, and normalize the conversation that we all need mental health support. We need on the job support for like firefighters, police officers, surgeons, you know, e e you know, emergency doctors, you know, EMTs. This is, a, this is tough. This work that we do is difficult and we need to debrief after cases and we need each other to lean on. And then number two is, you know, stigma of not being able to ask for help. I mean, we need to help people without having them feel like they're gonna be punished and having restrictions on their license or losing their license altogether and having no income. Um, three is trauma, you know, certain specialties. I, I don't, you know, thankfully in family medicine, I don't, I don't see much trauma, so I don't, I don't really need that that much on-the-job support. But I, there are specialists like you all who I think do need on-the-job support and uh, a place to to be debrief or talk to the chaplain or somebody, you know, help in the hospital. That's just normalized. That's not like written in the EMR part of your record. You're not sent off to a psychiatrist. You know, just just sort of normal. Uh, the fourth one more relates to primary care and outpatient medicine, but this whole assembly line medicine seven minute visit routine just doesn't work for anyone. And so that's why a lot of physicians are branching out in the outpatient medicine world doing sort of relationship driven clinics and more ideal, you know, work situations. So, so next, and I think the, that's my last slide is just some maybe links to articles that I think might be of interest to people. The top one is the one talk that I gave in DC that nobody came to, but then became very popular and went viral online. And then a number of other um, references there that I guess you can send out later. And I'm happy to take questions and I'm sorry I spoke so long. You, you were right on time. You didn't speak too long. And we have, uh, I think, an ideal amount of time left for for our next uh, panelist, which will be David, but we'll, we'll leave that slide. Or we'll, yeah, go ahead and move on. We'll, we'll share those with everyone uh, uh, on the site as well so that they can access that. And just the, at a minimum, just uh, Google search uh, Pamela or idealmedicalcare.org and you can get access to these. So uh, thank you again and, and feel free to uh, interact with our remaining panelists. Uh, I've known David now for over a year, and uh, David's uh, uh, done a lot in this area for uh, an even longer period of time, but uh, um, just became aware of it as I'm starting to pay attention to these topics. Um, David, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us a little introduction yourself? Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Good. So, 
Basically, I'm a spine surgeon. I created from a top spine fellowship back in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1985. And about two years after my fellowship, my fellow fellow committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning, which obviously caught my attention. And about seven years ago, one of my fellow spine surgeons walked out, walked out of the operating room and went and shot himself. And, uh, and then in 2002, I actually crossed the lines, getting ready to um, you know, do myself in also. But the thing that's never talked about that I would like to bring in the conversation, and I think we probably should do some separate webinar, is that what really sets off people in suicide is, is anxiety. And what happens to doctors don't like to talk about anxiety. And I was a master of suppressing anxiety. And it turns out that anxiety is simply a neurochemical reflex to the environment. And it's a million times stronger than the conscious brain. It's not subject to rational control. Can we go to the next slide? And so basically, uh, a doctor, um, Lisa Feldman Barrett out of New England, just wrote a book called How Emotions Are Made. And basically, every the way human consciousness is formed is that we unscramble signals. So a chair is a chair, because our brain says it's a chair. Um, humans have a problem that we have concepts that get, that get embedded in our brain, just like a chair or car or desk does. So what happens, every thought is connected to a physical, physical sensation and vice versa. And so the way we survive on this planet is, is that we process sensory input, then we behave in a way that avoids danger and trouble. So dangerous sensations are avoided and we survive. And of course, we gravitate towards towards um, positive sensations. Go to the next slide, please. So my term for the whole nervous system is a junction box. So there's obviously different senses coming into the nervous system that are being all competing at the same time. And then the one she that Lisa Feldman Barrett points out at the very top is called introception, where your body is also connected to, to your internal organs, your stomach, chest, everything, et cetera, is also connected. So there's the sum total is pleasant. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you get a chemical response of oxytocin, dopamine, and the GABA receptors. And mo again, most of the time, our behavior is in a realm that's neutral, so we stay safe. The species, of course, that didn't stay there, didn't survive. Then it was unpleasant. We have adrenaline, cortisol, endorphins, and other unpleasant chemicals. But um, what happens, then you feel the anxiety, or then you feel relaxed. So when you feel anxious, you're simply feeling that survival chemical surge. And the reason why it's so critical to understand that is that it, it is an unconscious part of the brain, which is a million times stronger than the conscious brain. That's why in the mental health world, anxiety is so hard to treat because it's not subject to rational control. Let's go to the next slide. So what happens is that humans have a problem is that we have thoughts and concepts that we can't escape. So Shakespeare pointed out there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. The problems that humans have with consciousness is that we can avoid unpleasant physical stimuli and threats to remain safe and stay in that neutral zone or we can gravitate towards pleasurable sensations. But with thoughts, we cannot escape unpleasant thoughts. In the research, actually, it's a term called URTs, which is unpleasant repetitive thoughts. And whether you suffer, suppress, or mask your thoughts, they're there and you cannot escape them. So what happens, which, which is probably the basis of chronic pain, by the way, anxiety is the pain, is that mental health and physical health are pretty much the same thing because the chemical effect on the body is the same. So it goes to the same area of the brain, same chemical response. So basically the term mental health, I think is actually a term that probably we should consider discarding because it's just a way of processing sensory input. So in other words, thoughts and concepts are sensory input that give us unpleasant chemical environment and you can't escape it. So what did me in, and what did my best friend in about seven years ago is unrelenting anxiety. When I give my spine patients a choice between getting rid of their pain or their anxiety, 90% of them said, look, I want to get rid of my anxiety. I will unequivocally tell you that if I had to live my life with the anxiety that I had um, started at age 38, um, I'd, be, I'd, I'd check out even now. It's, it's not logical to remain in that state of anxiety. Go to the next slide. But anxiety is a term that surgeons don't acknowledge. We're the healers. We're sort of the people who are supposed to be above it all. And so the problem is that we absolutely don't admit to having anxiety, but that's the problem. And so we're talking about long work hours, lack of sleep, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the problem. 
So stress isn't the problem, it's this chemical response to the stress. Next slide, please. So the bottom line is we're trapped by our thoughts. Go to the next slide. And when you're trapped by anything, whether it's finances, relationship, uh, job, boss, whatever it is, you, you go to the situation where you become angry. So you have a circumstance that you blame, and then you're a victim, and then you're angry. Well, it turns out that anger and anxiety are the same thing because the antidote to anxiety is control. When you solve the problem, anxiety drops and you move on and you also survive. When you're trapped, let's talk about thoughts for a second. When you're trapped by anything and you can't escape, your body's going to kick in adrenaline, even more adrenaline or more stress chemicals to solve the problem. So basically, anger is anxiety with a chemical kick. The problem with anger, it's about survival. It's only about you. And it's destructive. And it's and so what happens, what kills people, it isn't depression, it's anger. Because anger is destructive. The ultimate act of destruction is suicide, self-destruction. And I never can figure out for years why there, there were so many murder suicides, not just amongst physicians, but in general. But again, anger is destructive, it's self-destructive. So it actually kills people, not just physicians, but any professional, is this unrelenting anxiety. And then again, this chemical kick with anger, and it's a destructive force. Almost every suicide or mental health thing I've ever gone to about physician wellness has simply never mentioned anxiety. And I was given a seminar one day. Um, I actually teach mindfulness-based surgery. And I was sitting up there looking at this whole thing, and I realized our culture is very judgmental. We're very perfectionistic. We create anxiety even more than most people do. Of course, many professions are very perfectionistic and self-critical, but me medicine is judgmental. We're competitive. So for us to actually flip this around, we take a massive cultural shift. First of all, acknowledging anxiety is an issue that doctors are humans too. Second of all, understand that anxiety is not solvable by normal psychiatric means. You have to do basically somatic tools to calm it down. Go to, go to the next slide, please. And so the next slide. And next slide. So what happens is that, again, this is a very, I do seminars and this is hard to condense this. So the bottom line is a solvable problem. You have to understand the nature of the problem. The medical culture has got to understand that we are human, we're not superhuman. And what actually drives us into college, top grades, medical school, residencies and fellowship actually is anxiety driven by perfectionism. And we're perfectionists, we're never good enough, we're always driving ourselves. So the same energy that takes us up the hill takes us right down the other side. And so for me personally, I honestly did not have anxiety. I didn't get into one of the top spine fellowships in the world by having anxiety. I became a master at suppressing it and I honestly didn't know what it was. My whole thing was just bring it on. So I went from that state of mind to having a panic attack when I was 38 years old. And from that point on, it was 15 years of absolute hell so when people talk about burnout, the word probably may not be a good word either because we're talking about, well, too hard work, long hours, lack of autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the problem. Every profession has stress. It's this incredible need to achieve beyond words. Of course, everybody encourages that. So we have an adrenalized nervous system that we don't know how to turn off. And so that's the line, that's the bottom line to be taught right there in medical school. It should be mandatory that people get coached on how to deal with anxiety. It's not that hard, by the way. Um, I did write a book on called Back in Control, A Surgeon's Room About Chronic Pain. Again, it turns out that the, and Jeff and I talked about this yesterday, it turns out one reason I, I know a lot about this, because the same characteristics that create burnout in physicians is the same as patients in chronic pain. Is sort of one of the reasons why doctors don't like treating chronic pain because their patients trigger the same response in the doctor as the patient has, which is basically anger-driven anxiety. Next slide, please. So the right now, again, I can talk about this for a while. Um, I have a website called backincontrol.com. There's four stages. It's about 90% self-directed, and we have hundreds of patients going to pain-free, but the major factor that is consistent is that anxiety is 
permanent, but as you learn to calm down the nervous system, de-adrenalize it, shift into different neurological pathways, um, the anxiety drops to the floor. So I went from having a full-blown anxiety disorder in the form of a full-blown obsessive compulsive disorder, which is sort of considered untreatable in the, in the psychological world, I'm fine, I'm thriving. And I honestly didn't know you could live a life like this that's rich, full, enjoyable. I'm not crushed by anxiety, but you can't put programs into place that people can participate in when they're literally being crushed by anxiety. And I, you know, different people on this panel have had different levels of burnout. And we all know when you're absolutely crushed by anxiety, it's intolerable. And there really is no way out except suicide for most people. I got lucky. Um, we can talk about this in, an, in another panel about, you know, how to get out of the anxiety, but it's not very hard. It's incredibly easy. And if we could pull this into a systematic approach right there in medical school and make it mandatory, I think we, we would make some huge changes. David, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, excellent information. And, and I may have some questions, but I wanna also give others an opportunity uh, is there any others on our panel or any of our uh, uh, listeners that have any questions? I just totally agree with what you say about the anxiety. I mean, I've suffered with anxiety. Two of the cases that I'm most familiar with, including Chris Dawson's case, it was fueled by untreated anxiety turned into anger. And so I just, I just want to thank you for the insights and, and, and using words that are not, that don't carry as much stigma, I guess, for whatever reason, like um, at least in Chris's case, he was much more comfortable with the word anxiety than mental health issues. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, we just, it's not very hard. We're all human beings. This is a universal problem. Um, we're actually jumping into family issues with the chronic pain stuff and people fight. Couples trigger each other and it's particularly intense in people with chronic pain. And, you know, the divorce rate in medicine is over 60% and in neurosurgeons it's over 80%. And, you know, we're judgmental, we're perfectionistic. And the problem is when you're judgmental, you're really projecting your judgmental view of yourself onto other people. So we're judged by our mentors, then we judge our kids, we judge our spouses. And then we isolate. So by definition, when you're judgmental, you start becoming more and more isolated, which of course makes the problem worse. So I do think there's some ways to actually organize a prof profession and say, look, it's got to stop. I mean, I've watched this problem being talked about for almost 30 years now, and it hasn't been solved. It's getting worse. There are some solutions. And I think some of the conversations should revolve about how do we systematically you know, really start solving the problem. I mean, the beautiful part of that is this is one of these conditions that doesn't require like a two million, three million dollar NIH grant. Like we mm -hmm. actually could solve this relatively right. simply, you know, by right. just implementing what we already know. Right. right. Yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. Well, and what I I love. Uh, our entire panel because everyone's uh, been saying very similar things, changing up the words a little bit. I mean, I just noticed in your your concept of of judgmental and competitive, and that in the in the anecdote uh, or antidote that uh, Pamela is talking about is treating each other like family. Right. Um, you know, and and. And I could go through each of your concepts or step, um, uh, philosophies and, you know, look at the parallel and what, what Pamela is doing or, or the information that Anna shares and, and some of the things that we're trying to do with, with Surgeon Masters is kind of create a family of, of people willing to talk about things. It's, it's super, uh, this has been awesome. Uh, is there other questions or comments from others? Well, I would just like to, um, this is uh, Joe Surgeon. Um, to the last speaker, Dr. Hansen, I'd like to uh, find out, I, you know, I also suffer from anxiety. And did you mention you wrote a book that? Yeah, go back one slide for me, please. Yeah, I wrote a book, Back in Control. And right. so... I, all my fellows now are being, first of all, I was mentored by my sport uh, golf instructor who has been on this show. So we teach the same tools in surgery. We actually use surgery to practice the tools. 
which basically is simply somatic tools. We actually practice writing exercises. You simply write down your thoughts, tear them up. Over 300 research papers document how that works. And then we just do what I call active meditation, which is a very active meditation, which is a very brief form of mindfulness just to feel the instrument and calm down. So surgery is stressful and situations are tough. So instead of going focus, 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 you're actually connected to the focusing, not to the move. And we just, we probably train, we've done fellow training now for about six years on this with just remarkable results, consistent performance. We probably saved four marriages before it's all over. And I, again, I'd love to talk to you in, at length. I, I, I can't tell you the dozens of colleagues I sort of talked off the ledge here. And what's exciting and a little bit disturbing is that it's so simple. It's just not very hard. And once you realize that anxiety is just simply the adrenaline, and we find ways just to de-adrenalize de your nervous system, things change actually very quickly and also very powerfully. So within two to four weeks after you start the process, you'll notice a shift. And by three or six months, you're you're free. It's Wonderful. really Thank you. exciting. And there's probably Thank no adverse going. effects, right? I mean, there's nope. like, right? It's, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. not like taking drugs. Nope. Yeah. Well, once again, and I, and I hope I'm not cutting off any questions, but you know, the cool thing and the great thing that I've enjoyed with doing these web conferences and, and sharing the links of other people's information and making a connection between uh, Joe Surgeon and, and uh, Dr. Hanscom, uh, as well as uh, others to Pamela. Uh, we'll see if your theory on whether men connect to men uh, more than women uh we'll see if that pans out we'll we'll do our own little ongoing experiment uh but this has been awesome these are these are ongoing conversations it sounds like uh, that we have a bunch of people that are sharing information that is valuable and easy for others to incorporate and the only way you can do it is if you stay connected and if you stay involved uh and communicate with uh our family of uh of uh, other folks in medicine and surgery. Uh, at that, I think I will, just because our conversation could go on indefinitely, I'll, I'll close us today. And uh, thank again, all of our panelists and, uh, and hope that everyone can join us in January when we do our uh, next, uh, next web conference, which will be on uh, resilience and kind of integrating it in with the the concept of uh, resolutions and New Year's and, and hoping that we have an opportunity to continue to make progress in all of these areas. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Uh, ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.